Well, good morning. I'm Lisa, and I am the elementary director here at CCC. I'm really, really excited to be here with all of you this morning, have this opportunity to share with you, and happy Mother's Day. Thanks. So I was thinking about today, thinking about Mother's Day, and I'm a mom. I have two daughters. They are grown and married, but um, this memory came to mind recently of when they were very young. I was a younger mom at the time, and um, it wasn't one of my best memories, truth be told. It was actually probably one of my biggest parenting fails. <laughs> you know how we all have those highlight reels on social media? This would not have met that that criteria. Uh, yeah, it was one of those moments where I was saying to God, um, what were you thinking, letting me care for other humans? This isn't, this isn't good. Now, thankfully, everything worked out in the end. Everyone is okay, but at the time of the story, not so much. <laughs> um, so like I said, I was a young mom. My girls were easily under five years of age, and I had taken them to the pool one day. My oldest, Gabby, she was just learning to jump off the side of the pool and swim back to the wall. Now, my youngest, Taylor, she was terribly afraid of the water. She preferred to stay in the shallow end, and we had this gradual entry at our pool, so she would walk in, and her toes would hit, then her ankles, then her shins and her knees, and you could hear her talking herself into it. She'd say, I'm so brave, I'm so brave, you know, in her little two-year-old voice. And uh, she had no no need for the water back then. It's interesting because she's a marine scientist now. She, yeah, she got over her fear and uh, she loves the water. But then, not so much. So anyway, on this particular pool day, my husband hadn't come with us just yet. He was going to meet us afterwards and I had the girls by myself. So the deal was that Gabby was going to practice jumping off for a little bit while Taylor waited on the side. She was perfectly content being afraid of the water to just have her feet splash. Right? And then after we were done practicing, we'd all go to the shallow end and play together. Well, after one of Gabby's jumps into the water, um, as I was swimming her back to the wall, I noticed that Taylor wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm uh, frantically scanning the pool deck, calling her, Taylor, Taylor. I didn't think to look in the water because, you know, she was afraid of it. But Gabby, or Taylor was also very enamored with her big sister, Gabby. She wanted to be just like her. And I guess on this occasion, she decided to be just like her and jump in without telling anyone. So of course, I look to my right, and there is Taylor, just heading down to the bottom. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it was a moment. Um, so put Gabby up on the wall, stay there, you know, grab Taylor, scoop her up, bring her over to the wall. She's spitting and crying and sputtering and get her settled down. And she says... I kept calling for you, Mommy, but you didn't hear me. <laughs> I mean, what a knife in the heart, right? Like I said, parenting fail moment, not one of my better memories. But, you know, what's interesting about that whole scenario is that in the moment when it was all happening, adrenaline was working for me. I was good. I did what I needed to do. But when it was all over, and we were over in the kiddie pool, where we stayed the rest of the day, by the way, <laughs> And just so you know, water wings, they became our friends. <laughs> um, but when we were over there, I started churning inside. I was so uptight, and I, I just was a wreck. Well, sure enough, about 15 minutes after this incident, my husband John shows up at the pool, and he walks in all excited. He's smiling. He's ready to spend the day with his girls. And I run up to him, and I just grab him around the neck, and I'm crying. Uh, tears are uncontrollably coming from my eyes, and he's looking around like, what has happened? What is going on? So I tell him what happened, and he's trying to console me and say, they're okay, everything's okay. And he, and he was right, but all I could do was think of the what ifs, right? What if I hadn't pulled her up in time? What if she had been seriously hurt? And in that moment, I felt so grateful she was okay, but also at the same time, I felt a bit desperate. I was desperate to make sure nothing like this ever happened again, desperate to keep my children safe, desperate to make sure my girls never felt the way Taylor felt in the water when she couldn't get to her mom. I'm guessing everyone in this room can tell a story of when they felt desperate. Maybe desperate moments are unfortunately a part of this life, aren't they? We see them in our own lives, in the lives of family members and friends. We see them written in the pages of books and splashed across TV shows and movies. 
As much as we hate desperation, it is something we can all relate to. I'm guessing everyone in here has had a desperate moment. Maybe a loved one returned home from work or school later than you anticipated and you couldn't get in touch with them and you're desperate to know they were okay. A relationship isn't going as you hoped and your heart's hurting and you're desperate for peace. You're awaiting your final exam grades or to see if you got into that college you applied to and you're desperate for answers. A visit to the doctor requires some tests and you're desperate to know things are going to be okay. Maybe it's been more than just a moment. Maybe it's been a season, a diagnosis you're living with, and you're desperate for healing. A marriage that's on the rocks, you're desperate for reconciliation. A dream that hasn't come true, and you're wondering if it'll ever happen for you. A loved one that's passed, you're just desperate to hear their voice or see them one more time. But today, I want to look at a woman who is desperate. She had a physical problem, and she is desperate for healing, and she might be one of my favorite people in the Bible. I think we have so much we can learn from her. If you have a Bible in one form or fashion, go ahead and get to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Now, an interesting thing about this story we're about to look at is that it's sandwiched in the middle of another story. It opens with the story of a synagogue ruler, a man named Jairus, who had a 12-year-old daughter, and she's dying. Now, word has gotten out about Jesus. Up to this point, he's performed many miracles. He's healed many people. So the story opens with Jesus being surrounded by a really large crowd. And in the midst of this crowd comes this synagogue ruler, a prominent leader in the community who is desperate for a miracle. Jairus, the synagogue ruler, falls at Jesus' feet, and he pleads with him to come heal his daughter. And the Bible tells us Jesus went with him. That's where our story picks up because as Jesus travels to Jairus' house, this large crowd follows and presses in around him. Let's look in the Bible and see what happens next. I'm going to pick up Mark chapter 5, verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd, and he asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I love that moment at the end, but in these 10 verses, it's just 10 verses, there's so much packed in here. So let's start first by looking at the woman in the story. Let's get a little bit of background about her. Now, the Bible tells us she'd been suffering with a condition where she had been bleeding for 12 years, and she had spent all her money on various doctors, but only grew worse. Something important to note is that in this culture, during that time, the Jewish community followed very specific laws concerning blood. Blood made someone unclean. So if a person was bleeding or came in contact with someone that was bleeding, they were considered unclean, and they were unable to be a part of their community for a period of time. They would need to go undergo specific rituals and wait a set period of time to be made clean before they could re-enter the community. Now, most people would follow these rituals, and they usually could re-enter their community within a pretty short period of time. But for this woman, she was hemorrhaging continuously for 12 years. She was completely unclean, according to her tradition, and couldn't be a part of her community in any way. She was isolated, ostracized, unable to enjoy any human relationships. And because she was considered ceremonially unclean, she couldn't worship. She was most likely disowned by her own family. She lived alone, away from everyone. 
a complete outcast. Can you imagine not having one friend in the world, not being able to have a conversation with anyone, having everyone look down on you, knowing people are afraid to come near you or interact with you in any way, and add to that, she had no idea what was wrong with her. The Bible tells us she spent all her money on doctors, and no one could heal her. She actually grew worse, thinking she felt quite desperate. I'm guessing she experienced anguish across every part of her existence. Her issue defined her and the entirety of her life. That is, until she met Jesus. Now, we don't know how this woman learned of Jesus. My guess is on the outskirts of the town where she lived, she heard of this man and his ability to heal. She was desperate, we know that. But I think there's more to her story. She's known to us as the woman with the issue of bleeding. But I see her as the woman with the most beautiful faith. In my book, she's got guts. She's a risk taker who decides to put aside what everyone else thought about her and take a chance on this man named Jesus. We're told that she comes up behind him in the crowd and she says to herself, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Some translations say that she touches the hem of his cloak. Now, what we know about Jewish men during that time is that they wore ritual tassels that were placed on the four corners of their garments. Maybe they look like this. Hopefully you have one of these. They were on the uh, chairs when you came in when you arrived today. Now these tassels had been worn on the garments of Jewish men for generations since the time of Moses. In the Bible, in the book of Numbers, there are specific instructions about this. And the tassels were meant to remind Israel to faithfully follow the Lord and obey his commandments. They're also connected to a verse in the book of Malachi that says, The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Now this verse matters because the word for wings there in that verse, it literally means corner. And it's the same word used to describe the tassels on the four corners of Jesus' garment. And did you catch what the verse said about these wings or corners? The Son of Righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. One of the pastors here at CCC, Joe Wilson, um, he knew we were talking about this today, and so he shared this image with me. Joe saw this when he was in Israel in a town called Magdala, and uh, this mural actually hangs in a prayer room in a first century synagogue. I love this image. I actually printed it out while I was preparing for today, I, I would look at it, and I felt so inspired. It gave me this sense of what it must have been like for this woman as she tried to get to Jesus just to be able to touch the hem of his robe. And when she finally gets there and grasps that corner tassel, she's healed immediately. I, I find the disciples' reaction to this healing particularly interesting. I actually find it kind of comical. <laughs> uh, we remember earlier when we read that Jesus asked who touched him, and they respond by saying, you see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, who touched me? Funny to me that they question Jesus, like he's being ridiculous, you know? It's like they're saying, uh, Jesus, look around. Everyone is touching you. Duh, right? But Jesus is insistent. He stops, and he looks for the person that touched him. And when Jesus finally finds her, he addresses her, and he says that her faith has healed her. Jesus stops everything to find the person who touched him. And when she finally comes forward, he engages her in a conversation about her faith. He takes this opportunity to show her that her healing didn't happen because she touched his cloak. He wants to make sure she knows this wasn't some mystical thing that was contained inside his garment, but instead that it was his power and her faith that healed her. And while this woman's faith is something to be noted, I know I want to have a faith like that. It's Jesus' response to her that I find so powerful. First, Jesus stops everything. Let's not forget, he's on his way to heal a girl who is dying. He has a desperate father traveling with him. And he stops to talk to this woman. 
this outcast, this person whose own family will most likely have nothing to do with her. And this is no small thing, because remember, her touching him, even the hem or tassel on his garment will make Jesus unclean. But Jesus is willing to be interrupted even by those who the rest of the world has discarded. Jesus shows us in this moment that with him, we do not go unnoticed. He stops and he insists on finding the one who touched him. Verse 32 says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Even his own disciples, they're ready to move on. And he says, no, I'm going to stop. I'm going to make time. And he engages with someone who's technically going to make him untouchable. The rest of the world has placed her in an invisible prison, keeping her out and away from everything and everyone. But Jesus, in this moment, shows us that there is no barrier that can keep us from him. He stops and he stays put until she comes forward. And then we come to my favorite part of the whole story. After the woman realizes she can't escape unnoticed, she comes forward trembling, scared. She tells Jesus the whole truth. And do you remember what he says to her? He calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. A woman who's been isolated by everyone, who has no family and has probably been disowned by her own biological parents. A woman we know as the woman with the issue of blood is now called daughter by the God of the universe. This woman crawled to Jesus unnamed with a condition that wreaked havoc on her life for 12 years, but she walks away healed and named you know, this is the only time in the entirety of the Bible that Jesus refers to anyone as daughter. This is one of the things I love the most about Jesus. This moment right here, it draws me to him. And not because of his ability to heal, but because of his desire to connect. Do you know God knows everything about you? There's not a detail that's not known to him. He knows your hopes and dreams, your fears, your worries. He sees you. He sees each one of us. So many of us think he's checked out or he doesn't care. We can especially feel that way in times of desperation. Maybe we're not desperate, but we think God has other stuff to worry about, more important stuff. Or maybe we think he's unapproachable for us. But this encounter... It's evidence that he pays attention. He is interested in you. Do you know this about God? Do you believe this to be true about him? That he is a God who cares deeply about everything that you're going through. He knows it all, cares about it all. This woman's encounter with Jesus shows us that. Remember, he restores this woman, but not just physically, in every way. She goes from being a woman whose worth was probably shattered to a woman valued by Jesus. She approaches him as someone who doesn't feel she fits or belongs anywhere, but now she belongs to Jesus. She was unwanted, and now she's claimed and called daughter by her Savior. I think this story shows us that Jesus wants to, us to know we are seen by him. And our status, or what we bring to the table, is not part of the equation. Remember, this story opens with Jesus following a prominent leader in the community to his home so he could heal his daughter. But he stops in the middle of this very important man's request to address this very unimportant woman. And by the way, Jesus gets back to Jairus. You should definitely go and read the rest of that story. But the point is that Jesus doesn't value what we value. He doesn't put people in caste systems or pecking orders. He doesn't measure our worth or connect with us based on our achievements or our financial status or any of the things we measure as indicators of success. He sees each and every one of us as valuable and worth stopping for because that's the kind of God he is, because he loves us. So I wonder, is there something you're desperate for today? What do you need to reach out to God about? I realize this story happens pretty quickly, and we don't have all the details. 
It can be easy to gloss over the fact that this woman suffered for 12 years. We land in the healing and we celebrate that and get excited about that, but 12 years, that's a long road. A lot of us might hear a story like this and think, well, I've been praying for God to heal me or a loved one. I've been praying for my marriage. I've been asking him to take away my anxiety and settle my heart. Where's my healing moment? Is God even there? Where's God in the middle of that? I want to encourage you because while it may not go the way it did for the woman in our story, I believe Jesus sees you in your most desperate moments, in the midst of the crowd, with whatever you're facing. He's there as we reach out to him. <clears throat> Back in 2008, I entered a season of life that brought moments of desperation for me for the better part of 10 or 11 years. My dad had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and we moved him to a long-term facility where he could be cared for, and he had multiple strokes, was unable to walk or care for himself, and the dementia was getting worse with each passing year. My dad was in that facility for eight years until he passed away in January of 2016. It was a rough season for me, for my family. I hated seeing this hero in my life lose his ability to be independent, that he didn't always remember me. That was pretty painful. In many ways, when he died, I actually felt a bit relieved. Of course, I would miss him, but in many ways, I felt like I'd lost him eight years earlier. And relief came knowing that all of his suffering was gone. He was healed and walking again with his Savior that he loved. Well, a year later, almost to the day, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. I remember being at the hospital with one of my brothers and one of my sisters, and the doctor came out from surgery and basically told us that because of my mom's age, it was going to be difficult to treat this cancer, but they would try. But he said, the treatment will be palliative. And he also said, spend as much time as you can with her. I drove home from the hospital that night, and I remember just crying out to God. I kept saying to him, I can't do this again. I just went through this for eight years with my dad. And now... I have to watch my mom, who's already gone through a whole lot over the last eight years, caring for my dad, go through this. And in the midst of my prayers and my tears, a verse from a song that I knew, a, an old worship song, kept ringing in my ears. It's a song called Fail Us Not. And the bridge to that song has this statement that it says over and over again. It says, he's bigger, you're bigger than the battle. And I wanted so much to believe that. But it was hard. And I was feeling pretty lost, pretty desperate. Fast forward a few months, and we learned that my mom, <clears throat> pardon me, needed to move from her independent living cottage to the personal care assisted living facility on her, the campus where she was living because that chemo and radiation treatments were going to be really hard on her, and she couldn't be left alone. That was really hard for my mom to lose her independence. And in the midst of all this, there were some dynamics happening in my family that were really challenging. Add to that, my youngest was 10 hours away at college, and she was going through a really, really tough season of her own. So I'm walking her through that from afar, and I just felt like things were hitting on all sides. I remember that fall, I was so overwhelmed. And by Christmas of that year, 2017, my husband and I found ourselves saying, next year, that's going to be better. That's our year, 2018. But uh, New Year's Eve of 2017, my husband's only brother died unexpectedly. It was a terrible shock. Fast forward to April of the following year, and my sister-in-law passed away unexpectedly. It just seemed like there was one tragic moment after another. Now, there were some wonderful moments in that 10-year period as well. Both my daughters graduated from high school and college. They got their first jobs, and they were doing well. But in 2019, after my youngest graduated from college, she decided to stay and live in South Carolina where she had gone to school. And three months later, my oldest moved to Florida. Now, I've since adjusted to the empty nest. I've actually come to enjoy it, so hang in there, moms and dads of littles, you know. But at this time, there was yet again another hit, and it was another adjustment for me, knowing my girls would be a plane ride away for, on a more permanent basis. 
Letting go of them for college was part of that 10-year period, and that was hard enough. But now they wouldn't be coming home on spring break or for the summer. So here I was yet again, feeling so many emotions, struggling a bit to find my way. Now listen, I'm not telling you all of this so you say, poor Lisa, or feel sorry for me. I'm telling you this and sharing this with you because I want to tell you that in that 10 to 12 year period, which was followed by a global pandemic, by the way, <laughs> I had some pretty desperate moments. Moments where I didn't know what to do or which way to go, and truth be told, I wasn't always good at this. But in the moments where I decided to reach out to God like the woman in our story, I got to see God be bigger than every battle I faced. He became bigger than anything I was desperate about. And you know, it didn't always come with healing or a cherry on top. Sometimes it was an unexplainable peace in the midst of some pretty dark days. Sometimes it was Jesus reminding me that he was there walking with me and I was his daughter. One day it came in the form of watching my own mom and her faith. I had brought her home after one of her doctor's appointments, and the news we received wasn't what we were hoping for. My daughter, Taylor, was with me on this particular day, and when we got my mom home, my mom said to us, girls, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back in my room, and I'm just going to pray and read my Bible. Here was my mom going through the most challenging circumstances, and her first reaction was to reach for Jesus. I remember sitting in her kitchen with my daughter that afternoon and saying to Taylor, that right there, that's unwavering faith. And I told Taylor that I hoped my mom's legacy of faith would continue through me and through her and, my, and her daughter, or her sister Gabby and their children one day should they have them. Having faith isn't something that's always easy, right? It takes risk, can require perseverance. We saw both of those things displayed in the woman in today's story. I'm here to tell you, it's worth the risk. It's worth not giving up hope. Because on the other side of this 10 to 12 year season of my own, I can tell you, I saw Jesus stop for me. I saw him meet me in my most desperate moments and give me peace, his peace. I saw him restore me and breathe life back to my days. When the woman touched the tassel on the hem of Jesus' garment, he asked, who touched me? And the word touch there means to fasten or cling to. It was as if Jesus was asking, who clung to me with their whole being? And I want to encourage you, whether you're in a season of desperation or not, that Jesus Christ is worth clinging to with your whole being. We have a God that is worth reaching out to. And the best part is you don't have to worry that you won't reach him because our God has already reached out for you. He's got his hand outstretched, grasping for you. Remember, CCC, we serve a God who was desperate to make a way for us to be close to him, to be a part of his family, so desperate that he sent his only son, Jesus, to the world to die on a cross for each and every one of us. He's already reached out for us. And he is willing to be interrupted with whatever you want to bring to him. So I'm asking you, are you willing to reach out to him? I hope you will. I believe you'll find it worth the risk. Now, as I mentioned earlier on your seats when you came in today, there was one of these tassels. And there's nothing magic about this tassel. It isn't meant to be a lucky charm. But my hope is that you'll take this tassel and you'll place it somewhere in your home maybe as a bookmark, or hung somewhere where you can see it each morning, and then let it be a reminder every single day when you look at it to reach out to Jesus, your Savior, the one who reached out to you first, the one who loved you enough to die for you, the one who says, you are not defined by your issue. You are defined and named by your creator, God, and he is willing to stop and pause for you. Because he loves you. So right now we're going to stop and pause. We're going to take a few moments to reach out to him. And remember how he's reached out to us. Each week when we gather, we celebrate communion. 
And it's a time for us to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross. Take bread because it represents Jesus' body that he gave up for us. And we drink juice because it represents his blood that was poured out on the cross. Now, as you get ready to take communion today, I want to encourage you to think about what it might look like for you to take the posture of the woman in this story. She was desperate to be near Jesus. Maybe take hold of your tassel and ask yourself if you see Jesus as someone you need desperately. Because here's the thing, CCC, when it comes to sin, we're all desperate. The Bible tells us we all fall short and sin separates us from God, but it also tells us that we have a God that wasn't content to leave it that way. So he sent Jesus to die in our place. Let's take this time to reflect on that sacrifice. Be reminded that God wants us to draw near to him, to be close. Let's reach out to him. I'll pray, and then you can feel free to spend time with God as you take communion in your own time. There are packets in the back. If you didn't get a chance to get one, you can get one now. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God that's willing to be interrupted, that you're a God that's willing to stop and that you notice us. Thank you for grace, for forgiveness, for making a way for us to be right with you. Thank you for the ultimate sacrifice you made as you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, to be raised to life. Thank you that you are for each and every one of us. Help us to live every single day from that place, knowing we are dearly loved by you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.